It's great to be here speaking in person. Uh, and uh, thank you all for coming out on this uh, lovely afternoon. Um, so I'm a geologist. I, I didn't know what a rock was until I went to college. And I took a geology course and, and uh, found them pretty fascinating. Uh, and I've learned over the years that most people don't look at rocks. They, okay, there's some rocks over there, and that's it. Uh, turns out that rocks are different from one another, and they have a history. They have a past. In video for the Zoom audience? Just yeah. unmute. Start my video. <laughs> Okay, have we got both of those now? Good, yes. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, good. Um, I was talking about something, I'll think of it soon. <laughs> Rocks. That's it. That's it. They do. And it, it, so what I want to do this afternoon, my goal this afternoon, is to help you see some of the rocks that are around Waitley and um, understand where the evidence is for some of the stories that I'm going to tell. So Waitley has a, has a long, a very long history in, uh, in its, its geology. And uh, other people have thought about that history. You can read about, there's some good books to read about the Connecticut Valley history. Uh, there's one by Dick Little who taught at Greenfield Community College, Dinosaurs, Dunes, and Drifting Continents. This is very good. Uh, and there's another one by John Hubert, who is a geology professor at UMass. Uh, if you're interested after our conversation this afternoon, you might want to look at one of those. I suspect they're in the local library. And if they're not, they, they should be. Uh, so I'm going to show you things, and I'm hoping it's not too bright in here uh, to see them. Uh, but I want to start with the, the big view. You know, where are we? Well, we're here in, in Massachusetts. And uh, let's get in a little closer. Uh, you can see this is a relief map. So it's colored to show elevations. It's a, a published by the US Geological Survey online. You could get to it. Uh, and in recent years, we've had a new way to find elevation data. And it's a technology called LIDAR. Uh, and the L is for laser, and I'm not going to get the rest of it. Um, but basically, you can fly a, a, a plane or a drone and get uh, elevations to within a meter. Uh, so that we can zoom in on this and see things that you didn't used to be able to see. Uh, it's a construction, so the plane flies over and it, it sends a, a beam of light down and it times how long it takes to go from the plane to the ground and back up. Sometimes it hits a tree or some vegetation, but the software is able to pick out the points that go all the way down and remove the vegetation. Now, sometimes buildings get in the way, and you'll see that there's some buildings that the software tries to remove. But so that's what this is from, and we're going to zoom in. But I want you to just look for a moment here. This is basically the the Appalachian Mountains, the Adirondack Mountains there. But here it is in Pennsylvania, New York, and up here in, in New England. And it turns out. No, when I was growing up, I was told those were old mountains. But they're actually not that old. There were mountains here long ago, really big ones. But they eroded away. And the mountains that we have today are relatively young. The rocks are old, but they're relatively young. And um, this, let me give you a, a sense about that. Uh, if you if you have something above sea level and it rains on it and gravity works, eventually it erodes away. The little particles go down the stream. And if you removed, oh, let's be generous, one millimeter from the mountain 
top in a year. That means in a thousand years, you would remove a thousand millimeters, that would be a meter. And in a million years, you would remove a thousand meters, a kilometer. Anybody know how high Mount Everest is? Hmm. Okay, I did it in metric, so we got to convert to meters or kilometers, and it's about eight kilometers up. The, the highest peaks of the world are just a little bit over eight kilometers. So that would take, if you were removing one millimeter a year, that would take eight million years. Hmm. You know how long ago the dinosaurs lived on the earth? Well, um, 200 million years? So the highest mountain on Earth can't survive that amount of time. All right, I have to correct that a little bit because the mountains on the Earth are literally floating on the denser mantle beneath. So like a boat, um, you know, a lot of it is underwater or an iceberg, and as you melt the top of the iceberg, the iceberg rises in the water, and so do the mountains as you erode from the top. But eventually, you, you eliminate the mountains. So our mountains turn out to be relatively young. Well, not relative to us. <laughs> this uplift happened about 50 million years ago, and, and it's still, still going on a bit. Okay, so if you look in, let's zoom in a little closer, uh, and you can see that where we live, it's colored green here, because it's lower in elevation than the Berkshires over here and the Pelham Hills over there. Um, and you can see there are river valleys here. And these river valleys have nice sort of plant-like, dendritic patterns to them. They're, they're, there are places where they, they seem to go in some lines, but mostly they're, they're, they're ignoring the rock underneath. But, we have a Connecticut River here, which is going pretty straight. And as a geologist, I would want to know why is that? Why, why is that? Well, if we look close, it's winding a little bit. But the, the general path is straight. We're going to zoom in a little bit more. We have this very wide valley that we live in, the Connecticut River Valley, the Pioneer Valley. And it's, that's not a normal valley. It's not valleys are not supposed to be that wide if they're just being cut by a stream. There has to be a geologic reason for it. I'm going to zoom in a little bit more. All right, we're getting closer. So this is the Holyoke Range, Mount Tom here, Mount Holyoke there. Here's Mount Sugarloaf, so we're getting, getting close to home. And you can see the Deerfield River coming down this way and the Westfield River with its branches over here. Coming in a little bit closer. Um, I changed to a Massachusetts uh, state uh, geology, geology website, which has a, I like the colors better for our, for our less significant elevations. But we're coming in here. Let's go a little bit closer. Oh, I'm taking off the color. Okay, it's a little easier to see, particularly in this light. Let's go a little bit closer. It's not just that it's a valley, but it's a flat valley. The floor of our valley is very flat. And that is unusual. And when you come, you know, we're, we're right about here, and we're right at the edge of the valley. We can look out over the valley. We're a little bit above it. But look what happens to the topography as we go west. You know this. You've walked it. It's, it's rugged. Out here, it's flat. And that's probably why we're here, because it's good farmland. It's a place where uh, uh, many people have come uh, to, to work the land. Ah, uh, yes, okay, here we are, Waitley. So this is a topographic, or a regular uh, street map with some topography on it. So we're right there if we take away, yeah, okay. So now you can begin to see some of the detail that that LIDAR begins to show. You can even see a little bit of the buildings here. Um, and there's, I-91. So we're, we're picking up the elevation of the raised I-91. And we're going to be able to see geologic features uh, that might otherwise hide from us on a, on a, regular, on a regular map. Um, and there's some things you can see. So flat valley here, 
Ah, but look, there's a little stream inside of this, this cut. And so as I look at that, I'm thinking, ah, that stream is eroding in there. It has cut into this flat surface, and it's winding around. But we're up above that, so why, why are we higher? And then just west of town here, just around the bend, it's suddenly the, it looks very different. <coughs> so what I want to do is show you what what the rocks are under this surface, and we can get some information from them. Um, but right away we can see that our things are eroding, they're washing away. The streams are cutting valleys, uh, cutting into things, and the streams are cutting up here too. Um, the prominent feature here is Mount Sugarloaf, and if you if you go out in the valley, out into these fields, you're going to find soil. <laughs> and the soil doesn't, I, I want to see what's under the soil. So I need to find a place where the rocks stick out of the ground. Outcrop is what the geologists would say, an outcrop of rock. Um, ledge, uh, if you're, if, uh, the, uh, if you have land up here, you might think about the ledge because you can't cultivate, you can't till it very well, or it's a problem. So let's look at what the ledge is that is so close to us here. Um, oh, so if we get on top of it, you've seen this picture many times. I found three right away on the web, uh, different seasons. But what we want to see is the rock that's sticking out and holding up Mount Sugarloaf. Uh, and we can look a little closer here. The color is a little washed out because our room is so bright. But I think you know the color of this rock if, because you live here. Wait, I have a, have a piece with me. <laughs> uh, this one didn't, didn't come from uh, Mount Sugarloaf because it's a, it's a park. I wouldn't want to take too many rocks from a park, although there are plenty there. Uh, and there are lots of other places we can find the same kind of rock. Well, what kind of rock is it? Well, if you look at it, so I'm here. This is a class I had up on top of Mount Sugarloaf. And you can see, we're looking at the outcrop. You can see it's bumpy. But the thing that a geologist would first pick out on it is that there are layers in this rock. So there are three basic kinds of rock that you might have learned about in a, in a course sometime. There are sedimentary rocks. These are rocks that are made up of pieces of things, usually carried by a stream and eventually deposited in a, in a lake or, or the ocean. And they, they're deposited in layers. The layers, you get most of the sediment coming when there's a big storm. That's when the, you carry the most amount of it. Um, second kind of rock is an igneous rock. So that would be a rock that froze, crystallized from a magma. A, a lava. It's a lava if it comes out on the surface. It's a magma if the liquid freezes somewhere underground. And that makes lava flows. Basalt is the most common kind of lava. If it crystallizes underground, the most common kind is granite. But there are some other names uh, that geologists use. The third kind of rock is a metamorphic rock. And it's one of the other two uh, that has been heated under pressure, meaning it got buried deep in the earth, the weight of the overlying rocks provided the pressure, and the heat is coming from the earth below. So if we look closely at this rock on the top of Mount Sugarloaf, well, it doesn't show up so well, but there, there are pieces of things in it. You might be able to see them in my sample here. They're little, little rocks inside the big rock. Mm, I don't know whether uh, It'll show up on the, on the Zoom, but um, the layers and the pieces of other things tell us it's a sedimentary rock. It is a sandstone, um, a red sandstone. You find that red sandstone in lots of buildings. This is a Smith College, uh, but you find it in Boston and in New York, um, and they, they sometimes call it brownstone. Um, but it is this 
basically rusty red sandstone. The redness is due to rust. That is iron that was in the original sediment that oxidized, uh, rusted, uh, when, the, when the sandstone was formed. And uh, it's found a lot of places. Uh, so here's, here's Mount Sugarloaf. Let's go north up the Pecumtuck Range, uh, past Poet's Seat to Turner's Falls. Uh, I'm going to just zoom in with this LIDAR to Turner's Falls. Um, if I go one step, uh, oh, I wanted to show you where the bridge was so you could see. Mm -hmm. So back, sorry. Mm -hmm. I'll stop here. And the, so the bridge is going to go across here. And we're going to look at some rocks right there. I guess the bridge goes about there. But what I want you to see is first there's this ridge. So you know, what's going on with this ridge? It does, does end in Mount Sugarloaf. But also, look over here. Can you see these lines? If you have good imagination, you may be able to see a stack of books or layers tilted. And that's what this is. This is the Turner's Falls sandstone, is the given the geologists to give it this name. OK, so here's the bridge, and we're going to go down, just downstream from that bridge. You can get there from the pull off up here. Well, you have to climb the fence now. It used to be a hole in the fence. I don't know whether that hole is there now or not, but there are ways to get down there. And if you look here, you can see some of these lines in the LIDAR. I'm going to show you a picture. We went there in a, with a class down under that bridge, and here are the layers. Red sandstone. There it is, inclined. Um, and here's looking closer. You can see the individual layers, so that's a centimeter or inch scale. Um, these are probably deposits from, as I said, maybe a big storm, maybe a hurricane storm, sometime when in the past. Because here it is. It's not horizontal. It's tipped up. So something has happened to it since it was deposited, because if you deposit, if you have a, a stream or a, a lake or an ocean and you deposit in it, the layers are going to settle out by gravity and they're going to be pretty nearly horizontal. So if you see sedimentary layers that are tilted, something has happened to them. They probably first got turned into rock, from sand into rock, lithified, turned into rock, and then tilted. Uh, and if you look at these layers, there's lots of interesting things. So this is a little closer view. I should have my scale in it. But you can see some of these things come up, and they're kind of cut off. And that's what happens if you know another event comes. So the, the, they're not so different in color, but this was deposited, and then the next one. And those are those little curved things that happen in a stream because of the, the bumps in, in, the, in the stream. Cross bedding is the name. And here's another thing. You know, it doesn't show up very well, but these are mud cracks. Mm -hmm. So some of the layers in Turner's Falls are coarse with sand, but some of them are really fine. They were, it was basically mud that was deposited. And because we can see these cracks that have been preserved in the rock, it means that it was very shallow water and sometimes exposed to the air in order to dry out. So we can look at these details of the rock and find out something about what it was like when these layers were deposited. They were shallow water. Um, there was current. Uh, what do I have else? And sometimes the current could be, bring some pretty big pieces. That usually means they haven't traveled very far. If you go to the end of the Mississippi River, it's all mud. There are no big pieces. You have to go upstream closer to the source. The stream tumbles the sediment and makes it finer and finer. So the Turner's Falls rocks, the Sugarloaf rock, um, it, the sediment didn't travel very far. And it was shallow water uh, much of the time. And there was a lot of air in it to make it red. If you look at the sediment in the bottom of the ocean, tends to be black. 
because there's not so much oxygen as there is in a turbulent uh, stream. And there was current. So we think these are stream deposits. Stream deposits, <coughs> not too far from the source. Uh, we can go further down the valley. So here's the Holyoke Range, and here's a place uh, on the um, east side of Mount Tom that I take students. Uh, oh, you can see, eh, can you see the layers? I can see them on my screen. There are layers there. Here they are sticking out of the Connecticut River. They're very thin because they're mostly mud. Uh, and the reason I think we might have been there is because this is right next to where we can find these impressions in the rock, uh, like the one on the rock here uh, that uh, the Historical Society now, now has from somewhere nearby with dinosaur footprints. Not only are there the footprints, but you can see these little groovy things in the rock. They might remind you of what the sand is like on a beach if it's a windy day. And you can get the little ripple marks in the sand from the waves going in and out and in and out. This dinosaur was walking and the waves were going in and out like this. It was walking parallel to the shore of a very shallow body of water. Uh, also in those rocks there, again, the bright light, but that's black, that's charcoal light. That's the remains of a plant. So there are plant fossils, uh, as well as footprints. There's pollen, there are other things. Uh, and, um, and so at the time that these layers were being deposited, dinosaurs were here. The sands, so here's a little, um, rule about layers. It, it's the layer cake rule. When you're making a layer cake, you put down the first layer, you frost that, and then you put the second layer down, and then the third layer, and as many as you have time for. Uh, but you don't put down the third layer first, because there's nothing to hold it. So the bottom layer is the first one. It's the oldest layer. And those dinosaur footprints are on top of this red sandstone they are younger than the red sandstone. So the red sandstone that we have here, and there are dinosaur footprints up in Turner's, up at, um, they were found at well, all, a variety of places here. Uh, but the red sandstone that is the lowest is, is older than those dinosaur footprints. I'll get you a number right. shortly. Um, let's see, what else am I, so, um, Am I doing it? So, all right. Uh, yes, I just wanted to bring you back to Waitley. Okay, so Sugarloaf and Waitley is here, so I'm going to zoom in on that. And I wanted you to know that it is my opinion, okay, I don't have proof. It is my opinion that if we drilled a hole right here, we would get to red sandstone. But I do know for sure that if we go right down about here to the backyard of um, former Smith professor Tom Litwin, in his backyard is red sandstone. It's right, it's near where the new trail starts. It's right down there. So I think that we, it's flat here, but it's a little higher here, and I think it's because there's some sandstone underneath this. And if I could look at the well logs, anybody up here drill the well, we'd find out, because you might well, no pun intended, go into the, go into the sandstone. Um, but something else is right over here. Let's look at that. Okay, if you go to the inn and go west, and where the road bends around, there's a big outcrop on the side of the road. That's a, this is a picture from that. And although there is some sense of layering there, it's a very different kind of rock. This is a surface that's rich in mica, so it's not 
it's not unlike this one. If I tilt this around, you can see the, the mica shine at you. Uh, the, the, the German name is Glimmerschist, because uh, it, it does kind of glow at you. And that's what's in that, in that outcrop just around the bend. So it is the beginning of rocks that go from there to way west of the, the west edge of Massachusetts before you get to sedimentary rocks again. These are metamorphic rocks. Um, they, you can tell if you have a metamorphic rock, if you have something like a, a mica in it, which is platy, and they're all lined up. Because if you squeeze the rock, the minerals will tend to, you know, if I push the, the logs line up in the stream and the, anyway. You know. um, not all of them, not all of them are metamorphic. Some are igneous. And uh, I didn't have a good picture of the outcrop nearby here, and I'm sorry, but here's a rock from, and it's, it's, a, it's a little bit deformed, and it's got this green stuff in it. But that rock right there is on the Smith campus, but it came from Waverly. And um, if we go back, yeah, yeah. When I drove here, is it pantry? No, when I drove from up from the uh, FedEx, you know, along that road, on the on the uphill side of the road, there's a lot of rock, and it's all it's all this kind of rock, not all green like this, but it is an igneous rock. This picture with Marshall Shock in it, who and there's a story about this. We, we get time at the end. Um, but this rock occurs from near the center of town, just a little bit, and it's in a, it's in a, a long, it's kind of like a sausage, all the way to the River Valley Market, uh, the, which was a former uh, stone quarry for the city of Northampton. The wall of that is the same rock as you find going up Rocks Road and going up West Brook. Um, it is a granite-like rock. It has a fancy name. We call it the, the we, the geologists who mapped it, called it the Hatfield Tonalite. Um, it's because it's a, it's like a granite, but it has a different kind of feldspar in it. Just it's a granite. We'll call it a granite. Um, and let me get um, and go back to that picture. Yeah, this isn't the one. I'll show you, but it's it's there. So we have igneous rocks, we have metamorphic rocks. In some places, the igneous rocks cut across the metamorphic rocks. Mm, I used to have a pointer that went somewhere. How can that be? I probably put it down when I picked up a rock. All right, so this is a granite, a pegmatite. This is schist. Actually, this is a different granite. Uh, so the, this granite squeezed between the layers of the schist. This one cut across it. That's at Turkey Hill in Northampton, where there's a, uh, some um, there was a quarry. And you can also tell if you have a metamorphic rock if uh, if you have the rock ductile enough to make folds. Uh, this is at um, Shelburne Falls. You probably remember when you used to be able to go into the, uh, the below the dam and play in those those lovely rocks. Well, these are the rocks that are, that are there. Metamorphic rocks. To metamorphose rocks, I say they were under pressure, and we have ways to tell what the pressure is. How would that be? So, I have a laboratory at Smith College where I can heat rocks under pressure, a very fancy pressure cooker, okay? And uh, I need certain pressures in order to get certain minerals to grow. The example that you probably would remember from the, the folk art of uh, Superman is that you can take carbon, in, which is in the form of graphite, 
uh, and squeeze it. Uh, Superman didn't bother to heat it, uh, but it crystallizes into a different form, diamond. And the pressure you need to do that uh, is equivalent to a depth beyond about 130 kilometers down in the Earth. So diamonds don't look for them around here, but some of the minerals, some of the minerals that we have in the metamorphic rocks down here, around here, required um, six or seven, let me get the numbers right, um, I'm thinking of it in pressure units, I have to convert it to, um, yeah, six or seven kilometers down. No, I know, sorry, six or seven kilobars, it's 20 kilometers down. So we needed 20 kilometer mountains in western Massachusetts. No, they weren't that high. They were most probably no bigger than the eight kilometers high. But when the, it eroded, the boat rose in the water, and we're now seeing things that were once 20 kilometers below something. And I know that because I need that pressure to make it in the lab. And I can show you where I can find those minerals in Goshen and other places. So west of town are metamorphic rocks. And they're hard. They're harder than sedimentary rocks. They're tougher. That's why I'm a metamorphic geologist, metamorphic petrologist. I like those tough, those hard rocks. I'm a hard rock geologist. <laughs> and we can see that because, where did it go? Over here where I must have picked up a rock. These rocks are sticking up further into the air. These rocks, the softer sedimentary rocks, have been eroding more rapidly than these rocks. They're eroding. Everything's eroding in New England, except locally you can you know, fill something for a little bit. But these are eroding faster than these. And if you believe me, we have about 50 million years since that last uplift to develop this difference in topography. And pretty much the higher things are the harder things, the more difficult to erode. It's not like um, a volcano that you know, builds up a mountain. These are eroding mountains, and what's high is what's left behind. It isn't eroding as fast. All right, I'm waiting for the question. What's going on here in the middle of these sedimentary rocks that is, why are they high? They're not on either side of this area, and it turns out over here are igneous and metamorphic rocks, too. So, igneous and metamorphic rocks, igneous and metamorphic rocks, sedimentary rocks. Except, at the top of Mount Holyoke, Mount Tom, and at the top of the Pecumtuck Range, and maybe you've seen, if you've been up one of those places, you, you've seen the cliffs, this is Mount Tom. You can see the cliffs, and it's got these this very angular appearance. And any geologist will be able to tell you this is what you get uh, when you cool a lava flow. It will shrink. The hot rock comes out on the surface of the earth and it it's solidifies and it shrinks like the mud when it shrinks. And it makes po polygons that work their way down into the rock and we're seeing the, the result of that. So this is a lava flow, a basalt, that's on top of Mount Tom. Here's a view, a similar one on Mount Holyoke, right along the road you could drive to the top. 
Um, and this is what it looks like if you looked close. It's brown on the outside because it's rusted in the rain, but inside it's, it's, it's black. Mm. And if you hold a, a, a sensitive magnet to it, it'll be attractive because there's some magnetite in it. Oh, and here's a thing, here's something you could look for. If you go to Mount Holyoke, go to Mount Holyoke, and I like to walk the road up. It's good exercise, but you can drive it, and where the road goes, makes a bend through the notch and comes up the back side. Right at that bend, you want to get out or, or walk there and look up above the bend. So you're going around the bend, it's up above the bend. Here's the red sandstone, and here's the lava flow. And that's the bottom of the lava flow right there. So at the time that rivers were bringing sand and mud into this region to make the red sandstone, there was also a lava flow. There was a volcano. Somehow, magma was coming up out of the earth. And that is a very important clue to the history. Because there isn't any magma coming out of the earth here now. In fact, there are lots of places on earth where there isn't any magma coming out. There are certain places that you can count on it coming out. And I think I've got some information to show you that. Um, oh, first of all, here's, here's another one of those um, colored maps that show elevation. And I didn't get it quite lined up, but the green areas are areas with metamorphic rocks and igneous rocks, except for the... And then in here, the brown, are those, those sandstones and mudstones with dinosaur tracks. Uh, and a lava flow here and here. Okay, remember we're right, we're near this. Mount Sugarloaf is sticking out. So unlike Mount Holyoke and Mount Tom, it doesn't have lava on the top of it. But it did. Okay, it did because this lava flow was part of that sequence. Sandstone, lava flow, more sandstone, mud, mudstone. Um, and um, we just eroded it all off of the top of Mount Sugarloaf. And what's left turns out to be pretty hard for a sedimentary rock. Um, so we live in a valley. Our valley is here because it's sedimentary rocks underneath and igneous and metamorphic rocks on either side. It's explaining this topography that we're seeing. <coughs> Why are those rocks here? Okay, and the lava flow is the clue. It's the thing that's going to tell us because it turns out there are valleys like ours or sequences of rocks like ours. Red sandstone, dinosaur footprints, basalt lava flows, all up and down the east coast of North America and on up here into, into Newfoundland. These are under the ocean. You gotta go out there and send a drill down to find them. These are under younger sediments. They're covered with young mud. But um, Hart, this is, we call this the Hartford Basin. There's the Newark Basin. Uh, there's a Culpeper Basin. There are several basins along here. They're not coincidentally following the east coast of North America. Okay, they were formed when there was no east coast of North America. And so, well, let me go to this picture. This one right here. It's when all the continents were together in a giant continent that geologists have called Pangaea. All of the, you know, all geology, all the continents were together. Is that, could that really be the case? Can you imagine Africa stuck up here against North America? 
when it was first proposed more than 100 years ago, most geologists said, can't do it. No, can't do it. We don't have any way to do it. You're crazy. You know, the, uh, you know, the funny farm is over there. Go, you don't, you know. But, and, and when I took my first course in geology in 1968, the, there were, it was a, 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 a distribution requirement like geology course, and there were a bunch of professors in it. And they actually debated in front of the class whether continents moved. Some were firm, some were again. And they were, they were serious. But by this, the 1970s, pretty much we had evidence that no one has found a better explanation for it. And let me go back to that evidence. Uh, let me go to the evidence first, and I'll show you these other things. It's this. This is my favorite map of the world. And it's not showing you anything on the continent. The continents are grayed out, so to speak. It's the seafloor, and the seafloor is colored based on the data from the ocean drilling program that started back in the 1960s. And the way it's colored, they, they, they would go out and they, they would put a drill down to the bottom of the ocean. And what they found was blue mud and then basalt everywhere. Mm -hmm. The entire ocean bottom, everywhere, except right near the continent where there's mud coming off, is basalt. This very, this is, this is the most common igneous rock on Earth. It's what comes out of the volcanoes in Hawaii. It's what comes out in Iceland. Mm -hmm. It's what you get if you melt the mantle of the earth, what's underneath all of us, you get basalt. But not only did they see that it was all basalt, they were able to determine the age of the basalt. Hmm, how would you do that? How many candles on the cake? Um, they used radioactivity to determine it. So, you know, you probably don't do much with radioactivity. In fact, it's a good idea not to. There are occasional times it's useful medically, but mostly we stay away from radioactivity. Although it's all around us in low doses. Because some atoms, some atoms spontaneously burp. They decay. They change from one kind of atom to another kind of atom and they give off energy when that happens. The one that's most commonly discussed is uranium. Uranium-235 um, uh, uh, radioactively decays, and when it's done, you get lead-208. I know you don't know the difference between 235 and 208, probably, but it's something you can measure because it's the mass. It's the, they different, they're different in mass, and they differ in other, other characteristics. So it's like, it's like a water clock. You fill, the, you fill the water clock with water, and then it drips into the bucket. And over time, the clock on the, or the bucket on the top gets lower, and the bucket on the bottom gets fuller. And if you know the rate that it drips, you can figure out by how much water is there as to how long it took. And that's what we do. Um, on Mount Holyoke, we have basalt, and there's some minerals in basalt that have potassium in them. Well, potassium, we get close to potassium, we get it in our bananas, and, but a few of the atoms of potassium are radioactive. Perhaps potassium-40. And over time, it decays, and it decays to another atom, argon. Never hear argon? Take a deep breath. It's the third most abundant element in the air we breathe. It's a noble gas. 
noble gas means if you're going to grow a crystal, it's not going to come. It doesn't want to be part of crystals. But the crystals on Mount Holyoke in the basalt that have potassium in them have argon in them because the argon has been produced over time by the decay of the potassium. So we take the basalt, we remove those crystals, we heat them up in the laboratory, and we measure the argon that comes out. And that, along with the potassium, tells us how old the Holyoke basalt is. Well, no. 200 million, plus or minus one or two minutes. Every measurement has some uncertainty. The tops of, our, of the Holyoke range, the top of the Kumtuk range, 200 million years ago was when that lava flow appeared. And that's consistent with the dinosaur footprints because their Mesozoic, which lasted from about 250 million years ago to 65 million years ago. So we've got different bits of evidence that are, that are um, agreeing with one another. The colors on this map are the age of the basalt on the ocean floor. And here's the key, you can't see it, but the oldest, the blue here, is about 190, I can probably read it on this, it's 190 million years. None of the rocks on the bottom of the Earth's oceans are older than 190 million years. None. Whereas the Earth, we think, is 4,500 million years old, 4.5 billion years old. So the ocean is young. And it's young because it's being made at the middle, the continents are pulling apart, and lava's coming up in the crack. Now I can go back to these other pictures. OK, so here's the idea. Something happens in the mantle beneath the Earth that causes it to rise, and it makes the crust bow up like an arch. And you know, if you pull the, an arch apart, what happens to the keystone? It's going to drop down. So that's what's happening here when the continent starts to get pulled apart. The, it's, it's been bowed up, and this drops down, and you make a rift valley. You've probably heard that term. Um, you hear about the one in East Africa, uh, where they, they, uh, they found some um, various hominids. Uh, Baja California is a rift valley. We live in a rift valley. It's just that when you start to pull a continent apart, it doesn't just make a nice one line. They're offset. There are multiple valleys. And eventually, some of them connect up and make the edge of the continent. And so that's what you're seeing here. They pull apart. But the rifting, there's still a rift in the middle. And it's still moving apart. But the rocks that are formed at this time are now over here. And there are newer ones there. So the rocks get younger and younger until you get to the middle where they're being made today. I got to go to Iceland. All geologists need to go to Iceland because it is on the mid-ocean rift. And these, are, these colors are the ages of the rocks. And the youngest ones are in the middle. The green ones are older. The purple ones are older still. And if you pay attention to the earthquakes in Iceland, you'll see these are where the earthquakes are. They're happening in the middle of that. Here's where the lava flows are in this rift area. It's split apart there a little bit. And when I went on this trip with Smith College, as my wife and I, we got to stand with one foot on the European uh, plate and one foot on the North American plate where they're pulling apart. And here's another place where you can look across a wider valley. And each of these is a fault uh, where the lava flow is sticking up on it. Um, so let's show you another picture. This is um, maybe my second favorite map of the world because the black dots are where all the big earthquakes are. And the red dots 
or where the volcanoes are. Except it doesn't show all the volcanoes really that are along the rifts, because we don't have people watching them there. Uh, but this divides the Earth up. You can see the rift line here. There's a specific rift. Uh, but if you pull the, unless you change the volume of the Earth, if you pull it apart in some place, they have to be coming together in another place. Mm -hmm. And that's what's happening around here on this ring of fire around the Pacific. They're coming together and one plate is going down beneath another one and leading to volcanoes on top. I'm not going to tell all of that story, but the Earth seems to be divided up into these plates based on those, those earthquakes. And those plates are moving relative to one another. And they're moving at about the rate that your fingernails grow. Uh, maybe a couple centimeters a year. Not too fast, but we can now measure two millimeters of movement relative to Africa because we have GPS. And we can measure GPS to millimeter. <coughs> level. It is quite amazing. So we actually are measuring how fast the, the ocean is widening um, by those GPS numbers. And when there's an earthquake, you can see, you can see the land move uh, with, this, with this GPS. Um, let's speed it up a little bit and just go back in time to when our valley formed. So this is a, a cartoon. Uh, but we have some reasons to do it the way we've done it because you can see these lines. These are on the sea floor. The topography on the sea floor shows us that. But also, we have compasses. And the rocks, the Earth has a magnetic field, and the rocks can record which way is north. So a lava can. When you cool a rock through about 500 degrees Celsius, it's curie temperature, uh, the, the rock will record the magnetic field at that time. And it turns out we can tell where the continents were, at least where north was, so we have more pieces of the puzzle to put together at different times. And so that information has gone into how we know where they move. So watch here, we go back in time. The, I'm doing it at 10 million year steps. Okay, so here we are at 200 million years ago. That's when we had our rift valley here, and the lava flow came into it. And it fits with this larger story. All right, um, there's more story. Okay, but the, the, the big piece here is that we live, we have a valley because the rocks in it are soft. Not that soft. <laughs> but they erode, they're less resistant to erosion than the rocks in the hills on either side. And so we have this, this special valley because of something that happened here 200 million years ago. And then all the subsequent things which caused the rejuvenation of the Appalachians and the erosion that's going on now. Sometimes we don't see these rocks because there's other stuff in the way. Oh, here is a geologist you know, they have to go look at the rocks, and then they write down what's there, and then they color their maps based on what kind of rock is there, the ledge. And so this is a map of our area with, um, with the gray, in this case, is, are those Mesozoic, those red sandstone period, dinosaur period rocks. The basalt has a slightly different color. Um, but these are the rocks uh, in the hills, and uh, the details are another story. But um, something that if you tell someone that you come from New England, they'll 
picture maybe this, stone walls. We have stone walls in New England. Where I grew up, no stone walls. The, uh, lots of the US, no stone walls. We have stone walls because we've got rounded rocks. We have these stones. You know, they're, here they are up in cold rain. Here they are uh, in the woods. Uh, oh, where is this? Peru. Um, here they are. I live on Hospital Hill in Northampton. We call it Village Hill now. Um, but it's a, it's a hill that used to have a state hospital, and now they've been putting housing there. And when they made new roads, they kept hitting these boulders. It's full of boulders, and there's a pile of them. There's just lots of boulders around. What are they doing there? Here's another clue. Okay, this is uh, the surface of a metamorphic rock. It's near Northampton. Again, it's, a, it's at Turkey Hill. Can you see these white things here? These are the layery things in the rock. But there are grooves in the rock going perpendicular to those layers. And in fact, the rock is pretty smooth, even though the layers are there. Here's another shot like that. This is the basalt on the top of Mount Oyo, or near the summit. And it's got a smooth surface. OK, there's some cracks in it. But then there are these scratches on it. Here's another uh, basalt. It may be harder to see the scratches. Here are the scratches. What do we got? Oh, this is on. This is in uh, uh, Central Park in New York City. That's, but I, I liked it because it's got. Can you see the folds here? Mm -hmm. But there are the scratches, and the surface is pretty smooth. And there's some sort of deep grooves. Okay. Well, I'm sure many of you. Oh, wait. There's another. Mm -hmm. Some more. Some more evidence here. These are all evidence for the same thing. Okay. This is a hillside, was a, was a quarry, uh, again, up, up that turkey hill. But uh, if you look closer at it, you'll see that it's a jumble, a melange, um, rounded boulders, sand, clay. And it's what you get many places around the hills here. If you try to put a, a spade in the ground, if you're not on a ledge, you still might hit a rock. It's the, the landscape in Massachusetts is draped with this stuff. Oh, yeah, in fact, here's one of the state geology maps, and they, they have these areas that show really thick piles of this. So it's called glacial till, and the, the thick piles, some of them are these elongated hills called drumlands, Bunker Hill, Beacon Hill, Baker Hill in Northampton, uh, and, and Village Hill, where I live, uh, special piles. And they are evidence, all of this is evidence that North America was, here, was covered by ice. That there was a continental glacier, continental scale glaciation. All right, let me list what we, we saw again. We saw the surface of the rocks smoothed and scratched. Uh, we, we saw piles of debris um, from the, the, the um, melting. So, OK, the glacier is, is ice. How do you get a glacier? You have to have snow. Snow falls in the winter, melts in the summer. But if it doesn't all melt in the summer, then it gets, it starts to accumulate. And, you know, if you pour your molasses on the table, as the pile of molasses gets higher, it starts to flow outward. And that's what happens to piles of snow. It, it, they get to be hundreds of feet thick. They, they start to solidify, the air gets squeezed out, you're left with this thing, glacial ice. And if you do this for thousands of years, you, you can make a pretty big pile of ice. It's got to be cold. You can't melt the ice in the summer. 
and eventually it starts flowing outward. And we have evidence that North America was covered by ice the way Antarctica is today and Greenland is today. The ice in those places flows outward. It scrapes off whatever's on the rock and even then starts grinding off more rock. It smooths the rock. It scratches the rock. And then it, um, when the ice melts, that material that it scraped off gets dropped or washed, or washed away with the melt water. The glacier, we think, only went to, um, it, we know how far it went because it went far enough south that it melted. It was flowing, but melting at the same rate. So you got to a point where, the, like a conveyor belt, it's all it's dumping what it's, what it's carrying. And let me show you the evidence for that. And so this is Ohio. I don't know if you can see these little curves here. Wait, I think I have a closer view. Yeah, now you can see them. These are piles of that glacial till. They're moraines. The end, you can see them today if you go to Banff, where the glacier ends, there's a pile. Uh, and the glacier has now receded from that pile, as it has in, in Ohio. But there were different advances of the glacier, and the, the one that went farthest is there, but a subsequent advance could scrape off the old one. And when I took geology, I was told there were four glaciations. We now know there were maybe 10 or 12, over 2 million years of time. So we are just at the edge of a time when there was a glacier right here. Wait, let's, let me show you a couple more things. Uh, that's the new light up, light up. you can see it, okay. Um, can't see this very well, so I'll show this one. But there are piles of rocks here. This is how far the glacier got. It's the reason for Long Island. It's the reason for Cape Cod. These are backbones of their hills of glacial till that the ice, there are rocks in Glacier put them down there. We should get rent, don't you think? <laughs> um, yeah, here's you can see the lidar in Cape Cod. There's the there's the, the moraine, uh, and you can see where the water, the melt water, has cut into. First, it deposited this stuff that was washing away, and then it later cut into it. Oh yes, and. These were big glaciers. If you go to Antarctica today, or Greenland today, the ice is about two miles thick, 10,000 feet thick. That's a lot of ice to have above us right here. But that's a pretty good guess that Waitley was sitting beneath two miles of ice. Two miles of ice. Nothing lived here. All the plants were gone. All the soil was gone. It was all scraped off and carried down towards Long Island. The top of Mount Holyoke and Mount Tom, they had those scratches on it. The ice just went over like a bump in the stream. This is Elm Street in Northampton. Look at the stone walls. Wait, let's go instead to, uh, you know, this is uh, Hadley. Look at the stone walls. How about Sunderland? There are no stone walls. Our valley doesn't have any stone walls in it. You've got to go west from here, but not in the valley. The glacier was there. The glacier dumped all the rocks when it melted. Why don't they have any stone walls? Because the plows don't pull them up. If we go, you can see it's very flat. Most, uh, you can pick up stone walls with the LIDAR if we zoomed in. I didn't bother to do that. Instead, I'm going to take you here uh, on, North, on River Road here. There's a little bit of property there that UMass owns. Well, they own a bunch of them there, but um, 
it's a place that all the geologists, all the geology courses go, because they, they brought a backhoe in there some time ago and cut into the hillside. Um, and look at what they find. You can see layers, right? It's a close-up of the layers. They're mud. They're clay. They're clay layers. What would happen to those layers if you came up by with a big scraping glacier? Gone. So they have to be after the glacier. They have to be after the glacier. And there are a lot of them. And there's some system to them because they're, they're fine-grained, that's the, that's the clay, and then coarse-grained, that's a sandier thing. Um, here, maybe you can see it. They grade. They start with a sharp boundary here, and then they grade up into the other. Uh, that one's, uh, there are my keys for scale. You can see the gradation. <laughs> Uh, Julie Brigham Greddy, who's a geologist at UMass, drilled a hole in, uh, out next to the Mullen Center. And this is a sample of the core that she took out of that hole. And there it is, one layer after another, after another, after another. These are annual layers deposited by water. And there are more than a thousand of them. So you can count them like tree rings. The, they're, they're found near glaciers where it's cold, the water freezes over. So it's a, it's a lake deposit. The water freezes over in the winter, and the fine clay can settle out. And then the spring comes, there's no melt water, it brings new sand, and, and you put sand on top of the mud. And then over the year, it gets finer and finer, and then it's winter, and we do it. So it's annual layers. And it can be, there are, there are other lakes, there are lakes around, around everywhere. There's been glaciers, and you can fit them, because some of them are thicker, so this is thickness, and some of them are thinner. And you can match them up the way you can match up tree rings. So um, people have done that. Um, and you can also use carbon dating because they're young. And it turns out that the River Road ones fit here in the puzzle. And they're about 15,000, 15 and a half thousand years ago. OK, we're not talking about 200 million anymore. We're talking about yesterday, 15,000 years ago. And there had to be a lake at the Mullen Center and at River Road. OK, here's our valley. There's the lake. <laughs> so when the glacier was receding, the water went down the valley, and it got stopped by a pile of sediment down near, um, uh, near Wesley in Connecticut and backed up a lake. You may have heard the name. This is Lake Hitchcock. It's named for Edward Hitchcock, who didn't name it after himself, but he was the first geologist to find this evidence that I'm talking about, the lake sediments and, and all. And here are some other lakes, Lake Albany, Lake Merrimack. Um, and this lake, although it never, Lake Hitchcock never was a single lake all that distance, as the ice retreated, uh, there were blockages in lakes much of the way up to Canada. Those thousand plus layers of lake sediment covered the glacial till. It covered the rocks. It made our valley flat because it's the bottom of the lake. Um, let's see here. Here's it. Here it is. Here's the lake on the uh, on the map. So you know, where are we? We are. Well, we're just up above the lake here. Oh no, sorry. We're just up above the lake here. Um, there it is in a different way. Uh, the blue is where the lake was. How do you know where it was? <laughs> Whenever somebody tells me something as absurd as if they knew where a lake was 15,000 years ago, you should say, how do you know that? 
And it, you know, just don't believe them unless they give you some clues. Lakes have shorelines, and they have where a stream flows in, there will be deltas. And there are deltas all around this lake. So for example, right over here, uh, so Sunderland, uh, this is the, uh, um, what's the name of the quarry? There's a, there's a sand and gravel quarry over there in, I don't know whether you're in North Amherst or Sunderland where the boundary is. Um, but it's the, uh, you can see the holes that are dug into the delta. Let's go there and see. There it is. You can see it maybe a little clearer. Um, and you can, there's a road you can drive right along here so you can look into them. Mm -hmm. um, here's, the, here's what it looks like on the delta. So this is Bull Hill Road right there. It's very flat, flat and smooth. Pretty good for farmland, although it's sandy. It's pretty sandy. Um, and uh, here's the view into that quarry, the Long Plain Delta. And you can see that there, the layers, if go a little closer, the layers are inclined like this. And they're flat up at the top. They're usually flat at the top. Why is that? So a delta, there's another view of it. As the delta builds out in the lake, it it's making a pile, but the lake continues to get deeper. So what happens is the sediment comes and goes off the edge of the delta and it makes these inclined layers. And that's how we know it's a delta. And this is where the, the top of the delta is the top of the lake. So that's how we know that the lake was at current sea, relative to current sea level. It's about 300 feet above current sea level. So a 300 foot contour is if you're below that, you're underwater. If you're above that, you were above the water. And it, the lake, as it drained, over it, it, there was a lower stand that was about 200 feet above sea level. That one I'll show you in, in one moment. How am I doing? Am I got a couple minutes left here? Um, oh, here we are. Wait, this is about Wakeley. So um, uh, this is Westbrook. Westbrook, and this is one of those deltas. It's the flat land that is the tree farm, uh, or the, we have extends over here to the tree farm, but also there was a quarry there, a sand and gravel quarry, just up the hill from, um, as you go up uh, Westbrook on the right. It hasn't been used for a while, uh, but you can go in there and you can see they cut into it. Uh, that was a delta locally. Uh, this is a view of, of Smith College where the campus center is. Uh, you can see the chapel there. So Elm Street is outside it. But when they were building that campus center, they dug into sand. And look, there are those inclined layers. Elm Street in North Hampton <coughs> is a delta. It's flat and no no stone walls, because it's a delta. And the delta is building out into the lake, and at the bottom of the delta, well, here's some of the delta sands, some nice little ripple marks, it wasn't too deep water there at the top. Um, yeah, this is, uh, sorry, Northampton, Paradise Pond. So the college is here, Round Hill is there, downtown. Um, I'm gonna show you a, a slice, a slice through, I think. Uh, what happened to my, I lost something. And I have, I could have lost, could I have lost the power? Okay, that wouldn't have thought so, but I the cord. charge that, that looks like that's the issue. Should 
Come on, come on, just a moment. All right, so if you go down, so the, um, the, the delta is built out onto the lake. The lake has those clay sediments. So when it rains on Elm Street, the water goes down through the sand until it gets to the clay. And then it can't go anywhere because clay is what you do to line your pond or, or whatever so the water won't go through. So the water is perched. It's, there's a water table. You could call it that because there's a... It, Elm Street fills up with water. If you have a basement there, you might not want it to fill up with water. But then it, it flows along the, the, the edges until you get to the over the Mill River side and then it comes out as springs along that side. All right, well, there's hope. Uh, now I probably have to reconnect. Um, it doesn't say I'm, okay, sorry. Should have plugged it in at the start. Little, um, its own little delta into the, into the thing. And then um, they just built a new library at Smith and they dug holes there and guess what they found? <laughs> Varves. These, these clay layers, they'd been deformed a little bit, those Smith students. Um, <laughs> and here's when they, when they built the, the indoor track. They cut down through, and you can see up here, you can see up here the, the layers, but down here is the till, the, the messed up sand and gravel. Uh, start my video, sorry. Go ahead. All right, and I'm almost done here. All right, and down below the till is the red sandstone. This is at the dam, and they've got the lake a little lower there at the college. And there you can see it. Um, this is red sandstone there. Um, and uh, okay, so here's our valley. Igneous and metamorphic rocks sedimentary rocks, a few places, there's a little, there, um, if you go to Warren Hill, there's some of the metamorphic rocks sticking up through. Um, and uh, this is the geology, this is the lake, and the places where there were those sand deposits. And here's the whole state. You can look this up on the, and it's called the mass mapper. There's the geology of the whole state. There's the, they don't have the superficial geology all done, but anyway, that's my story, and uh, you have great rocks here. <laughs>